Alrighty, everyone here in chapter four, we're going to be talking about the ethical and social issues in information systems. So the first thing that we're going to start off here is just talking about big data. We've introduced big data in previous chapters before. And um, as we deal with big data, as companies learn how to uh, harness the power of the big data comes, of course, some problems with that, not just how do we deal with store uh, analyzed big data, but also the problems associated with mining that data or what can arise from mining that data. So of course we have some of the problems with the opportunities associated with a new technology, um, but more specifically in, in regards to this chapter, it's the underdeveloped legal environment of this. So say you're a hospital system, say you're a healthcare system, say you're an insurance company, and you have access to huge amounts of patient data, um, and you have that in different data warehouses throughout your company, um, you can certainly mine that for, for good, and you can partner with maybe pharmaceutical companies and help to identify patients that might have certain medical conditions that might benefit from new drug therapies. Um, but now we're gonna get into the possible legal ethical uh, issues associated with, do you give a pharmaceutical company patient data, for instance, knowing that the end goal of that is to help identify patients to try out new drug therapies. So let's think about that. The possible benefit of course is to the patient, right? They could come up with new drug therapies or be, be part of new drug therapies. Um, and they're identified by allowing these uh, pharmaceutical companies, for instance, to be able to mine that data looking for patients with maybe certain medical conditions, certain comorbidities. Um, that means meetings, uh, uh, clusters of certain diagnosis um, or certain social, um, physical aspects to their lives. Um, so, what do you think? Um, do you would you allow um, your data to be mined, knowing that it could potentially benefit patients, um, or do you keep that under lock and key? And that's kind of a a big philosophical ethical question that is facing so many different companies. And of course, in this instance, I just choose healthcare, but it's a topic that comes up for so many different companies. What are some possible solutions of that? Well, as the book describes it, you can develop some of these things. You can develop some of the things in the bullet points here. You can develop some social, uh, some, some big, big data strategies. And what that really refers to is before you start collecting all of your data points, before you start building your data warehouses, have an idea of the purpose for which you're collecting the data. You don't start collecting data and then say, we're going to, we're going to use this for something. This, this data, this is gonna be a thing. We don't know what yet, but it's gonna be a thing. Before your company starts to collect data, you really should have an idea of the end goal um, so that we're making sure that we're collecting the correct thing, but also not too much. Um, we don't want to hoard the data um, that may not be relevant, may not be what it is that we're actually looking for, may not have a business purpose. Develop privacy policies and not just develop the privacy policies and the right policies, but develop mechanisms for um, auditing your systems and for reporting them and for enforcing privacy issues. These are hugely important, right? It's not just that you're gonna walk the walk or talk the talk, you're gonna walk the walk. Not only do you need to have these policies, but you need to have mechanisms for finding violators and for reporting them. And that could be things like hotlines, um, you know, compliance hotlines, it could be things where people can dial in anonymously or email anonymously. Well, email is a little harder to do anonymously, anonymously. but um, a, a mechanism for people to report um, wrongdoing. Big data predictive models. So once you have all these big data sets, um, being able to build an, an, a, some kind of analytics or models um, and mining technologies and predictive modeling systems to use this kind of in an autonomous manner, pull the human element out of some of the big data analytics and allow there to be some kind of autonomous algorithm doing it. Now, can algorithms um, and any kind of big data mining 
applications be slanted or geared towards whatever that developer wanted it to do? Yes, absolutely. It can be biased, completely biased. But hopefully there's enough developers on it or eyes on it that you can have some kind of framework around it to avoid that as much as possible. And again, pull that human element out if you can. So these are just some of the solutions around the dark side of big data, but the, the kind of the bigger two, the first two bullet points are have a strategy around big data before you go in and just start collecting things and have adequate privacy policies, police them, enforce them, encourage people to come forward with rule breaking, things of that nature. So let's just talk about some ethical, social, political issues that are raised by information systems. So we know what ethics is, right? Principles of right and wrong that individuals use to make choices and guide, that guide their behaviors. So um, information systems though raises some new ethical questions because they create new opportunities um, for, and I just have some examples here, intense social change. So information systems, if we start thinking about um, social media as um, lays on top of a giant information system, right? All social media lives on top of a gigantic database. Um, intense social change. So we can use information systems to distribute information, distribute messages, all sorts of, um, of, of social change can possibly come from these information systems uh, and services. They threaten the existing distributions of power. Uh, we saw in previous chapters before that something that is a potential upsetter to company regimes and management hierarchies and structure is that there's a more ubiquitous distribution of information across the company. And that can make managers nervous because information is power. And the more levels of employees and the more different types of employees have access to that information, the more empowered they are. And the more they have the ability to potentially disrupt the regime or disrupt the power, disrupt the management, disrupt the structure, um, disrupt the culture, disrupt everything. So the, the, the possibility for IS to be a disruptor for those distributions of power is huge. Uh, information systems also raise ethical questions and create new opportunities for money. Where has information systems recently um, in the last couple of years, created new opportunities to pull money out of thin air. If you haven't seen the Elon Musk memes, I'm upset. Cryptocurrency. Yep. And a couple different crypto uh, types of cryptocurrencies, correct? Um, a few, we of course have Bitcoin, um, but there's a few newer ones that have also popped up. The Dogecoin, right? Please tell me um, um, William and Erica, you guys have seen Ethereum. Absolutely. Ethereum. Okay, Erica. All right. No one Ethereum. Thank you. Um, the Dogecoin, please tell me you've seen the Elon Musk memes. They're my favorite. Um, with all the Lion King comments on it makes me happy every day. Um, but literally using information systems to create new currencies. Um, and I think Tesla just bought a whole bunch of, yes, Yes, uh, almost hit number one. Um, Tesla just bought a whole bunch of Bitcoin and the thought right now is that they're gonna begin to accept that as payment for some of their products, which is, which is kind of interesting. One of the, a big company that to, to accept those, uh, co those currencies. Um, and then we have rights, um, create new opportunities for rights, human rights, social rights, privileges, um, and then of course, obligations. Once you know what's happening um, in your country, in your world, in your community, in your environment, because of these information systems, um, lots of folks and lots of folks should have an obligation to empower, to enact change, to make change, to be the change. And those obligations um, are really strong. Of course, there's an opposite side of that, where we have a new kind of crime. We have cyber crimes, we have cyber stalking, um, we have all sorts of new theft. We have all sorts of new, um, every different type of crime that you can really think of. So while it has created some amazing social change, distributions of power, new types of currency, um, it's also really created a dark side um, around new types of crime and, and new ways to take, um, to take this a different direction than it was intended for. 
So the message there is the technological innovations truly can be um, a double-edged sword. And Robinhood is a great example, Erica, um, of that. And just watching the investors go nuts with the GameStop trading and some of the other trading that's going on and just wondering like what in the world is actually happening and so much of it being powered through Reddit, right? Reddit, just another information system that we're changing the distribution of power. We're taking that power, that information away from Wall Street and we're putting it in the hands of everyday investors. We're changing the money power of the distribution and taking it away from Wall Street, putting it on Reddit, which you and I have complete access to. Um, so we're opening up that access to power, which again, um, T traditional management structures don't like. Please don't take me as an anti-establishment person. They're very much a reason for roles and, and things like that. But you know, every once in a while, it's kind of nice to see the disruption in power, the disruption and uh, the change of information flow. I'm not gonna say that part of me doesn't enjoy seeing that just a little bit. Um, I don't necessarily yes. want the roles of society to collapse, but sorry, go ahead. There's an article, no, sorry to interrupt. There's an article I read the other day and it was saying like, the hedge funder investors like had a quote that um, retail investors were like attacking the wealthy or something like that by investing. So it was kind of fun, but um, the Robin Hood one is like a good example, like of how um, a huge ethical problem. I know they're being sued right now, but they might not get out of it because we like, or not we, but people who are on Robin Hood technically like signed the um, terms and agreements, so it, they might be protected, but I'm not sure. And we're also going to talk a little bit about Parler. What do we know about Parler? I'm, not, I'm seeing some head shake. What do we know about Parler, folks? It was supposed to be a major competitor, well, trying to be a major competitor to Facebook, but all of its servers got nixed because of polit political reasons, I guess. Sure. That's all I know about it. Caleb's saying they might have gotten hosted by a Russian company now. I didn't know they found hosting, so that could be interesting. And I think one of their their security functions was actually like the 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 limited demo version of the actual security function, which is part of why they 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 got hacked. <laughs> so I I enjoy the ethical, social, political question part. It's maybe me being a giant nerd, um, but it's interesting to see how some of this take takes effect, uh, how some of it takes hold, how some of it gets a foothold. The QAnon movement just fascinates me because I just can't understand how some of it happens, how some of people make sense of certain things that are happening. The distribution again of information and that information distribution becomes power. And it, look what it's done. Uh, it's created intense movements, good or bad. It's created these intense movements and the underlying IS systems that have powered it, right? I mean, we're, we weren't sending letters uh, back and forth to people to get this moving. We use some incredible ingenuity apps and information systems to do it. So like it or not, and that's not what we're here to talk about, whether or not these things were good or bad, we're talking about the application of IS and the things that they did. Um, and we'll chat about that in just a little bit because I have some questions for you on not just Parler, but um, privacy around that. So we know some of the things that were happened were certainly not good things, um, but how, how it was found out, was it, a, was it an ethics, was it a privacy violation? And I'll be curious to know what your thoughts were. So, just moving forward here, thinking about the ethical, social, and political issues more, you know, a way to envision how some of this works is just thinking of society as a non-moving, not quite stagnant, not quite stagnant, but like a still pond. Um, and then anything information systems or IT is just a giant rock or a boulder that we're gonna throw right in the middle of this pond. And it's going to create these shock waves that resonate out from the middle towards, radiate from the middle towards the end. And these new waves, these situations just aren't covered by the status quo. They're not covered by the old rules and regulations that we've always had. So how in the world do we deal with them? Well, the social, political institutions and the norms 
um, can't keep up with these overnight. They can't change overnight. The new legislation takes forever to keep up with it. So we saw how many times, um, um, goodness, how many times Robinhood um, kept trading on different, different um, companies and we couldn't stop it. Wall Street couldn't throw the breaker to stop it because we couldn't come up with regulations fast enough. Um, anytime there was stuff that was happening with Twitter, Facebook, um, goodness, now Reddit, um, Parler, we couldn't put the brakes on it fast enough because even though we have laws and regulations around what you can say and you can't, they can't adjust necessarily for the changes in technology fast enough. Let's think about the self-driving car movement and just about every manufacturer now has some toe in the water. We can't get to level five autonomy. Um, we can't approve level five autonomy, even though some manufacturers, um, probably Tesla, Waymo, um, are at the forefront of it. Um, they can't get the level five autonomy approved because the 900 year old legislators that are in, in our Congress for the most part still don't know how to use email. So if we haven't caught up to technology that's 30, 40 years old, how on the planet are we going to get some of these more contemporary uh, technologies finally approved? How long is it actually gonna take to get level five autonomy self-driving cars approved? I have no idea. I paid for it in my car and I still can't use it um, because it's not gonna get approved. I don't know anytime soon. Um, they've taken legislators, legislators in rides in these cars and they're like, wow, this is great. This is so amazing. This is earth shattering. This is breathtaking. And then when they get on the Senate floor, they say, this is dangerous. This is scary. We can't have this. Oh no, the boogeyman's going to come. So what changes um, from when they're in the car to when they're on the Senate floor voting? And I suspect it's, it's lobbyists and it's a whole lot of money from the legal powers, uh, the lobbying powers and other companies. But the, the moral of the story is that our legislative bodies can't change fast enough to adapt to the changing ethical, social, political, IT movements that are happening in our world every single day. Um, just talking about five dimensions of the information age, we'll talk about each one of these just a little bit more in depth as we go through the next several slides. So in the upper left, information rights and the obligations. Upper right, property rights and obligations. Kind of in the middle right there, system quality. At the bottom, the quality of life. And on the left side, accountability and control. So in the upper two, when we talk about information rights and obligations and property rights and obligations, there's the political, social, and ethical issues that are associated with all of those. And we just talked a little bit about some of the political issues, talked about social issues to the point of, um, you know, the, the movements, I should say, I can say the just movements that have been created by the empowering of folks through IS um, and ethical issues as well. Um, we'll talk about it, patient information sharing, perhaps uh, in my earlier example with healthcare data. And at the bottom there, when we talk about quality of life, the individual, the society and um, <laughs> politeness, um, uh, the, the way that information systems can change these couple of things, that the individual level, how information systems changes society as a whole, uh, it, it can it has such a profound impact on everything. And we'll, uh, over the next several slides, talk about each one of these a bit more in depth. So let's just talk, talk a bit more about some of the data analysis that happens and some techniques. Um, the first one I want to talk about is profiling. And this is combining data from multiple sources to create a dossier of detailed information on individuals. This happens a lot when you're using uh, social media, Facebook, Instagram, the Twitters, and really just a lot of website data as well, where a profile of us as a user is created based on our computer, our browser, our location, 
the sites that we visit on Facebook, the friends that you have, the posts that you make, things that you like, those kinds of things create a profile of us as a person. The next one down I think is really interesting and this is Nora. And this is non-obvious relationship awareness. And this is pulling together data from disparate sources, multiple different sources, and finding the obscure hidden connections that help, might help identify criminals or terrorists. I think this is a very, very interesting one. So this is looking at data that you might think has no business being together. Trips to the grocery store, um, the last time that someone bought gas, uh, website usage, um, I don't know, travel data, email use, text messages, um, all of those things, putting them into giant data repositories, allowing them to be analyzed by some uh, uh, algorithm analytics engine, and then potentially coming up with some kind of a reference between all of these uh, and identify individuals that could be identified as a criminal or a terrorist. And I have an article here from the New York Times. They stormed the Capitol and their apps tracked them. And I'll be curious to talk about this with everyone to get your thoughts a little bit. So this article is posted in Canvas. And I, I'm sure not everyone has read this yet, but this talks about the insurrection at the Capitol. A number of the people that were identified um, as being insurrectionists were actually located because of pings from their cell phone. So this is using data from various apps that, that we're using and watching them go from a Trump rally over to the US Capitol and siege the building. And this is just one example. So this comes a little bit from the profiling and also a little bit of Nora but people's apps actually tracked them as they moved around DC. And it's kind of startling to take a look at this. There are folks that are saying, I, I didn't do it, I wasn't there. And their cell phone tells a very different story and the apps that they use. Um, and you better believe all the apps that folks said they don't use, Parler, Facebook, everything else, sure do show up. In fact, some people's smartphone track them between 2 and 5 p.m. right inside the Capitol building. It's kind of hard to say that you weren't there when your phone pings your actual location. Even if you deleted the Facebook message and post that says I was there, all of your records from your phone basically telling on you um, that you were part of it. So it's really interesting. Take a look at this article, um, but um, it shows this one user's entire movement, their entire trip to DC from their home, absolutely where they moved throughout the city based on the data and ping data from all around where they moved that day. Um, and it shows this from a number of a number of different users and law enforcement were able to get all of this, this data. There's even um, the ability using Nora and some other techniques to re identify anonymous data anonymous pings and identify you who was once anonymous by this data back with who you could have you who you actually were. So even though we have companies that say they're, we're, they have our data as anonymous or maybe storing anonymous data on us or reporting anonymous data on us. There are plenty of ways to reassociate our identities back with that anonymous data, that quote unquote anonymous data, and even the companies that do it. 
So I know you guys haven't had a chance to read this article um, and I would encourage you to do it. I can put the PDF up there as well because if you open it more than like twice, it starts to tell you that um, you need a subscription to New York Times, but I printed it just so we had it. So taking a look at this quickly, tell me what your thoughts are. No thoughts, we're cool with this. I should turn off location services. That's part of it, um, turning off location services. You know, I'll tell you though, if you go to Walmart and you leave your Bluetooth on, um, it's using beacon services to identify you walking through the store. So while this is an extreme example, um, of an insurrection, uh, Walmart and Target, the mall, for instance, they know where you walk through the store um, and those locations because of your your Wi-Fi beacon, your Bluetooth beacons, uh, all of those um, all of those services that your phone is constantly pinging out to try to figure out where it is in the world. Uh, Target, Walmart, uh, and a number of other big box stores track your movement through their stores as well and sell that data to advertisers to their vendors and to help figure out how to how to set their stores up as well. So while this is certainly one example of it, your phone is doing it in a number of different ways and um, it, it, it's happening all the time with us. And Erica says, I think my main thought is that we forfeit a lot more information on our phones than we think. And that's absolutely accurate. <laughs> Who needs a microchip um, if it's all available from your phone. And that's, that really is it. Um, you know, I think people are focused on the wrong thing. These folks, some of these folks may very well say, think that the, there's a COVID microchip that you're getting and you have a free microchip in your magic phone all the time anyway. Um, I have a lot more pings from my desk to the fridge. I, I get that, I get that. Um, so I, I, you know, I want you to be aware of this. You can go, if you ever, if you've not done it before, go to, um, Google your um, Alexa privacy and how to listen to your recordings. And if you have Alexa, you can go into your Alexa device and listen to the recordings of yourself uh, and it stores them all. And you can go back, I don't know, 30, 60, 90 days and listen to all of your Alexa recordings um, that it has on you and um, listen to yourself. And uh, you should know that Amazon has all those recordings too. And they can do them for whatever purpose they, they so choose. Okay. Some other comments here. It seems like a luxury to have it in this situation. Um, but when we're the victim, it isn't as appealing. I would agree. It's nice to have it, but all of a sudden when your privacy is cracked, they say, we found you in all these locations based on your, your cell phone ping data. All of a sudden you're the victim. And how do you feel about having that privacy? Um, it's potentially gone. Um, and this is not Apple or Android giving up the data. This is your cell phone carrier. This could be Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, what have you, giving up these pings. Um, feels much more like a crime should be solved with this kind of information. It's becoming more prevalent. Um, FBI is the one that used all of this data. So this is becoming um, more prevalent in the United States. Um, Eli, you're right. Uh, in other countries, they do. Is it expensive to do it? Um, was a, a comment in the chat, and I don't have that information. I think you could subpoena cell phone records and, and get that, and I'm not sure the, the costs associated with that. So I don't have that. Uh, this is just um, another graphical representation of some of the Nora relationship watch lists incident and arrest, customer transaction system. So you're on a watch list and you went to Sheets to get the MTO and all of a sudden you were spotted somewhere. So I'm not saying don't go to Sheets and get the MTO because it is delicious, but you should know that your Starbs is also watching you because your credit card transactions um, are a telling sign of where you were just as much as your cell phone records are. And of course, if you're working and you're getting paid anywhere, well, that's pretty easy to figure out where you are as well. 
risk it all and go to Moe's. No, there have been much less poisonings at Moe's than there have been at Chipotle. I'm just saying. How many times a week does somebody get poisoned at Chipotle? Oh, this is on a recording, I can't say that. Um, how many more times has there been an outbreak at Chipotle than Moe's? So yes, I, you'll remember that in the emails, thank you. If you guys never wanna have me for another class, you could trash me in the emails and I'll never be back. But um, I think you've been having a better time in this class than some other ones. So you take that back and you take that back right now. Uh, responsibility, accountability, liabilities, all the abilities. Um, if you've not taken the quiz yet, some of these abilities pop up in the quiz. So make sure that you're um, aware of that. <laughs> e. coli at least twice a year. That's correct. Uh, the responsibility, attempting, uh, accepting the potential cost, duties, and obligations for one's decisions. Accountability. This is mechanisms for identifying responsible parties. The liability permits individuals and companies to recover damages done to them and due process. You'll often hear this is like due process of the law, for instance. Um, laws that are well known and understood with an ability to appeal to higher authorities. And like I, I mentioned, these, these four items here, responsibility, accountability, and liability specifically are, are some of the quiz questions in the bank. So just make sure you're aware of the abilities. When we're doing an ethical analysis, just a couple of the things in the, the five-step process when we're thinking about some of these things. Clearly, and I uh, identify and clearly describe any facts that you have, um, what is the conflict or the dilemma, and the higher order values involved. Who are the stakeholders that are involved? Um, any options that you can reasonably take and any potential consequences. So when you're identifying consequences, it shouldn't just be the obvious ones. You should have a second and third order consequences as well. If you take an action, what are all the cascading things that could possibly happen or somebody could happen to them or, or go wrong as a result of a decision that they made? Moving down towards some ethical principles. I'm sure all of us have, have heard the golden rule, of course, do unto others as you have them do unto you. But the one I actually prefer more is the platinum rule and treat others as they wish to be treated. Not everyone wants to be treated the way you do. Not everyone wants to be recognized the way you do. Not everyone wants rewards the way that you do. The rule that I think is the better rule is the platinum rule, treat others as they wish to be treated. Ask somebody how they wish to be treated. Ask somebody how they wish to be recognized or recognized or rewarded for doing a great job or for going above and beyond. Um, the platinum rule is not gonna be in any of your tests. This is a Gary inserted ethical principle. Uh, I just think it's something that we should know. Not everyone wants to be you and do things the way you want. Treat people as they wanna be treated. Uh, Emmanuel Kant's categorical, categorical imperative. If an action is not right for everyone to take, it's not right for anyone. If a decision you're going to make isn't the best decision for everyone, do not make the decision. If a guiding movement for the company isn't right for everyone and you're gonna be leaving people out, it's not the right action to be taking. And that kind of leads into CART at the end, the CART's uh, rule of change. If an action cannot be taken repeatedly, it's not right to take it at all. If you can't do something over and over again, it's not something that you should have done in the first place or you shouldn't be doing in the first place. There's a utilitarian principle. Take, she, take the action that achieves the higher or greater value For our non-gamblers, our risk adverse friends out there, the risk aversion principle, take the action that produces the least harm or potential cost. There's also the do no harm. And the no free lunch rule. 
assume that virtually every tangible or intangible object uh, is owned by someone unless there's a specific declaration otherwise. There is no free lunch. Somebody is paying for everything that is happening. If there is free food at the office, somebody paid for that. Free food did not just happen. You got a free computer, somebody paid for that. You got a free drink, somebody paid for that. There's, all, there's never something for nothing. So let's get into some privacy and uh, freedom rights as they relate to the information age. Some of us may have heard of some of these before, some of them may be new, um, and a bunch of them are a lot of acronyms. So I want to make sure that we're, we're aware of these. Of course, privacy, the claim of individuals to be left alone, free of surveillance um, or interference from other individuals, organizations, the state, um, and the claim to be able to control information about oneself. In the United States, we try to achieve privacy with amongst other things, these three bullet points. The First Amendment, freedom of speech. The Fourth Amendment, freedom or protection from unreasonable search and seizure. And um, there's some other ones uh, out there. The notable is the Privacy Act of 1974. That includes wiretaps and things like that. Fair information privacy or fair information practices. So this is a set of governing principles to collect and use information, the basis of most US and um, European privacy laws. So some of these are used to drive changes in the privacy legislation. And a couple that we can talk about um, and there's there's just three billion of them um, to deal with them. The COPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. I don't know. We have too many questions about that one. The Graham Leachum Bliley Act. And this is also called the Financial Modernization Act. And this is really for financial institutions to kind of disclose how they protect um, customers, banking customers, uh, financial information. And it, it moves into a little bit of the next one, the HIPAA health information privacy and portability act health information privacy i think it has two p's actually no nope. i wonder if i typed it wrong um, health information um, port portability and accountability uh, port i'm sorry yep yeah, i always want to say it's privacy in there health information portability and accountability act thanks Every time I type it, I can't remember if it has two P's or two A's. Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. And not only does this say that you as a consumer of healthcare have the right and the ability to your own healthcare information, um, you also are able to uh, be assured that people not involved in your own specific treatment do not have access um, to your information unless they're you know involved in your care or involved in the billing kind of procedure scheduling procedures of your act otherwise they don't have access to your information or shouldn't
And the Do Not Track Online Act, this is the ability for us to supposedly opt out of online tracking. Everybody okay? So just moving further, the Federal Trade Commission's um, fair information practice. The idea around this one, um, the notice awareness, choice and consent, access and participation, security enforcement around, um, uh, mostly around um, stock markets, securities, trading, investments. does not necessarily apply to rogue, rogue stock systems, or at least they're trying to get around it. Most of the US laws specifically around privacy can be starkly different than the European counterparts. In the Europe, our European counterparts, the use of data requires informed consent of a customer. Here in the US, it's implied that you opted in to have all of your data taken, used however you want, unless you specifically opt out. European member nations are opposite of that. You are essentially opted out unless you opt in. Um, stricter enforcements under consideration, rights of access, and of course, the right to be forgotten. Um, if you look up Google's right to be forgotten, you can actually go into Google and have them supposedly scrub all of your information from their systems. So safe harbor framework, the concept around safe harbor is um, access, well, uh, a product is exactly as it is described. There is um, you have to take everything at face value. There's nothing hidden un underneath. It is um, what you're purchasing is exactly what you see on the exact day that it is it is happening, being advertised or purchased. You can't necessarily say that you could buy this today and some additional things will be available later. Um, there's a little bit of problem with Tesla on that and advanced uh, driving features because you can buy things today that aren't available. And they're having a little problem with the safe harbor. And our boy Edward Snowden. What do we know about Edward Snowden? I don't, he doesn't necessarily need to appear in the European part of the show, but what do we know about Edward Snowden? I could be wrong on this, but I think he was the guy who blew the whistle on the Patriot Act stuff. He blew the whistle and the lid off of a whole lot of things. That's absolutely right. What else do we know? He showed people how easy it was for their information to be tracked and, and how vulnerable people's online. Yep. Um, I believe, do we know what administration? Um, we started to do so much of the data collection on that Snowden went all the way back to. Released information from NSA, yeah, Bush, the Bush administration, I think Bush too. Um, and it was really around after 9-11 um, when we started to basically just collect information on every single individual um, and how easy it was to, to collect that information, how much information we were collecting on everybody. Um, Edward Snowden um, met with a reporter in a different country um, with thumb drives worth of um, proof of how much data we were collecting on people and showed that. And it was a huge article expose. He had to essentially escape the country um, and he's still living in exile in there. 
uh, there's so much conversation around um, pardoning him, and I don't know that he'd ever be allowed back in the country. Um, so there's no right or wrong answer on this. Did Edward Snowden do a good thing? He blew the lid off of how much data the government, the US government was collecting on all of us. Without him doing that, it's highly likely that we would have never known the government was collecting so much data on all of us. It put a stop to some of it. It put parameters and framework around some of it. Um, it helped to bring a lot of light to something that was really in the shadows. Did he do a good thing or not? The security um, commissions all say that this was a terrible thing because all of a sudden people had information and we know that people in power don't like us people that don't have power to have that information. But had he not done that, we would have never known. So we're getting some chats that say he did a good thing. What do you guys think? There's no right, there's no wrong answer. I'm curious uh, more about the thought process. This is a chapter on ethics and privacy and, and this is what I wanna hear. Eric is here for it. That's right, and Matt says morally it was right. Um, you know, that's another side to this is he had the morals to say, I have to expose and tell somebody what was happening. Truth hurts, but I wanna know from Robbie. Um, I've never heard anybody reminds me of anonymous. Anonymous is kind of doing some of that work where he picked up exposing all the data that we have on people. Um, I think it was necessary. It's a good thing. Better for people to be aware. I'm seeing in the chats. Um, I agree. He formed generations of what was going on. Without him doing it, it truly is possible that we would never have known um, so much data collection was going on. So again, there's no right or wrong answer, folks. I'm curious to your thought process. I want to know what you think of. This chapter is all about what um, we're thinking. Um, Robbie asks, why were so many people against it? Well, it was exposing how much potentially illegal and proven illegal wiretapping the government was doing. Um, the, there was a Data Protection Act in 1974 that says wiretapping is illegal, but the government was doing it anyway. Um, <laughs> ignorance is, is bliss and, and that, I get that. <laughs> um, uh, but the government was doing lots of illegal data collection and um, this kind of exposed a lot of that. And it really rocked, rocked the government um, because it, it took away a lot of trust of the American people in that they were trying to protect their privacy. And here the government was stealing every bit of information and collecting every bit of information that they possibly could on its citizenship. So uh, it was kind of an ethics, huge ethics violation on our own government. Um, and I think it should be available um, if people want to see it. Through the Freedom of Information Act, there are certain things that are available, um, but certainly not a lot of a lot of this. So um, one of my employees always says he's fat, dumb, and happy when he has lunch in his lunch in his hand. And I say it now too because you know I, I see the ignorance is bliss and it makes me think of fat, dumb, and happy. Um, and I get that too. Like what what else don't I know about that I'm fine not knowing about? Maybe I'm just fat, dumb, and happy. Um, and that's, that's probably okay sometimes. Um, if you there, don't know there a lot also, about- Oh, sorry. Go ahead. The, no, there go ahead. are also some, uh, some sources that, that indicate that the leak that Snowden provided also exposed undercover operatives. So even yep. though the American people then learned about all this stuff, all of those people whose, whose information, who were working undercover overseas were then potentially in danger of being killed because their, their cover was blown. So- that makes it so that they, they they can't do that sort of work anymore because now anyone could could go look them up. Um, right. And some of them probably did get killed as a result of him releasing this information. So that's that's part of why people were not okay with him doing it in addition to the, the imbalance of power. Correct, great, thank you for bringing that up as well. Yep, um, exposed a lot of CIA operations, FBI operations as well, absolutely. Um, Caleb put in the chat a little bit of a documentary, uh, Terminal F. Um, there's a number of other documentaries, even short videos on YouTube that will kind of give you a quick brief synopsis of 
of Snowden, what he's done. Um, you know, it can kind of go into Julian Assange and the WikiLeaks as well. Uh, we're not going to get into that here, um, but um, that's another potential leak of huge amounts of government knowledge, data, papers. So, um, lots of <laughs> lots of potential um, blowouts and privacy violations. So, I'm I'm glad to get the discussion going on this. Um, I'm happy that you guys are aware of some of it and have some opinions on this. I want you to have some opinions on the ethics and the privacy and potential violations and, and just be aware of your surroundings. And if the the um, the New York Times article does nothing for you, but to get you aware of how much all of our devices are telling on us, well, then that article did a good job, but take a look at it as well. So some internet challenges to privacy. Um, anymore, when we use any internet browser, it's asking us if it's okay to store a cookie or keep a cookie on our, on our device. What in the world is a cookie? Small text file that identifies our browser, identifies us as a user and tracks our visit information um, to the website. Um, usually has, if it can collect our email address, our browser, our IP address, our internet address of our computer and some other maybe usage statistics about our website. And then that website uses it to track how often we go to the website. Um, and other websites will use it as well to track, you know, if we go to competitors' websites um, and other browsing data as well. There's also web beacons, and this will be a little graphic in an email or a web page. And it can identify who's reading the email or if you're opening up a website after reading those emails. So um, there's lots of other ways that um, we can track whether or not you've got an email, opened an email, forwarded an email, for instance, um, any number of things. And of course, lots and lots of different spyware um, applications installed on a user's computer that you typically don't even know about. Some of these have key loggers in them that can um, record all the keystrokes, which would easily identify a username and password um, to be transmitted elsewhere. And of course, can display lots of pop-ups and unwanted ad. Um, and um, Google is usually the one that's under fire the most for this. Um, but Facebook does it an awful lot through their Facebook advertising and their connections to Instagram um, using behavioral targeting. Um, how many times have you talked about something and then gone into Instagram and lo and behold, there's an ad for whatever in the world you just talked about that just showed up on Instagram and you swear that it's watching you or it's listening to you. Uh, how many times has that happened? Because I know, I know it's creepy as heck uh, or you talk about something um, <laughs> yeah, someone else said, uh, when you think about it and it shows up every day, every single time, um, at some point your phone probably asked for access to your speaker and it very well could be listening to you or your computer could be listening to some of those conversations. Um, if you searched for something in Amazon and all of a sudden it shows up on Instagram, that's no accident. And that first cookie here, the first bullet point, the cookie, um, is a big, a big reason that some of that's happening. Um, it's tracking your searches and your visits across platforms. But I've definitely been there where I've said something to a friend um, and it appears everywhere. I went to Macy's and I went to where they have the mattresses because I want one of the purple mattresses. I'm obsessed with it right now. And then I went to Yahoo and I'm scrolling through the news in Yahoo and it's all ads for purple mattresses. The word purple mattress never came out of my mouth, but I was near one and I swear it knew I was near a purple mattress and now that's all I see ads for. So I don't know if there was location tracking in Macy's from a, um, a, a Bluetooth beacon or a Wi-Fi beacon, but now they freaking know that I want a purple mattress and it, it upsets me. I almost want to not get one out of spite, but I want one. So we're going to, we're going to go down that path. Just get a tuft and needle one instead. <laughs> What's that? Just get one from tuft and needle instead. Yeah. I, it's, it's upsetting me how much we're tracked on everything. Um, so the more internet challenges, uh, the U S allows businesses to gather transaction information and use this for marketing. So target, uh, absolutely can gather all the transaction information in Walmart on all the things that we purchase with any kind of um, frequency or even one time and market us with coupons or ads, services, anything like that. 
Uh, we have an opt-out model in the United States, meaning that you're automatically going to be tracked unless you decide to opt out uh, versus opt-in, which is in the European uh, Union countries, which is an opt-in model. And online industry promotes self-regulation over privacy legislation. And what that means here is that the government is allowing all of these industries to self-regulate versus stepping in and saying, no, here's what you can and you can't do. Um, it's complex, it's ambiguous privacy statements that no one on the planet can read or would read or understand. And it's, in my opinion, designed just to keep us out of it and to keep the data coming in fat, dumb, and happy, as I like to say for myself. Um, the opt-out model selected over opt-in and online, quote, seals of privacy principles. And that's where companies can go to third-party sites and um, pay for that company to say, to come look at your website or your, your online store and say that they're doing what they can to protect your privacy and you know maybe not giving cookies or not selling your data. And uh, what are they gonna do? Report you to the Better Business Bureau, which has absolutely no teeth to do anything other than a complaint board. Um, so how much are online seals worth? Well, probably not a whole lot. Um, and, but they're, ex they exist and probably another more. Um, intellectual property rights. Um, I'm sure we've come across these in our travels before, but what is intellectual property? This is an intangible property of any kind created by individuals or corporations. So this is not a physical item. Three ways that it's protected. It's a trade secret. So intellectual work or property belonging to a business, not in the public domain. What is a trade secret? Well, the kernels, what is it? How many, how many herbs and spices? 35, 15, 11, 12. How many herbs and spices are there? I don't know. The recipe for Dr. Pepper, that's a trade secret. The recipe for Coke or Pepsi, it's a trade secret. Um, it's the 11 herbs and spices. That's what it is. Those 11 herbs and spices, they're a trade secret. And they're protected as intellectual property. A copyright? a statutory grant protecting the individual property from being copied for the life of the author. So think of a book, for, in, for instance, the author plus 70 years. And the last one is a, pa a patent. Um, a grant, uh, grants creator of intervention, um, the exclusive monopoly on that idea behind the intervention for 20 years. There's others, there's things like a trademark and a service mark as well. And those may be a logo for a company, things like that. Um, but these are the main three. What makes these difficult to enforce? Well, with digital media, you know, movies or um, graphics that might be created, the ease of replication, the ease of transmission, we can send them across an email, we can FTP them, lots of things. The ease of alteration, we can open it up in Photoshop or Illustrator, change a little bit of it, and all of a sudden it's a brand new image. We can change the colors or the lines and it's a new image. Um, the file sizes are much smaller. And with certain things, it can be difficult to establish uniqueness and say that no one ever created this ever before you did. Um, it can be somewhat easy to manipulate the create dates on these things and say that we're the first ones to have created it or the only ones to have ever created something like music, for instance. And the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, makes it illegal to circumvent technology-based protections of copyrighted materials. So it is illegal for us to download pirated movies or music but with all of the things in the bullet points right above it, it's still hard to enforce. It's just illegal. So a bit of another point here for discussion, computer related reliability problems. If the software fails, who's responsible? If it's seen as a part of a machine that injures or harms, um, the software producer might be reliable. So 
a software runs a roller coaster and the software fails, it doesn't clamp down the brakes on the roller coaster and two trains collide. Alan Bradley, for instance, uh, who might have been the manufacturer of that software, um, the industrial controls for that might be held as reliable. But if, the, if that is similar to a book, if it's held similar to a book, it's difficult to hold the author or publisher responsible. So the programmer from Alan Bradley programmed the software correctly. It just failed and the two trains collided and somebody died. But it was programmed correctly. The software just failed. Is the programmer still reliable? It was programmed correctly, but the computer failed. Who's at fault? Alan Bradley? The programmer? The amusement park? Nobody? Hard to tell. If it's a service, who would be responsible for a telephone system not being reliable for transmitted messages? So if, it, if you were supposed to send, I don't know, um, a, a message from um, someone to a stock market to buy certain stock and the message didn't make it there and they didn't buy the stock and they lost millions of dollars. Could T-Mobile get sued because the message didn't transmit? Hard to tell. To Justin's point, someone said, uh, Justin said in the chat, feel like most people would blame the park, but there's more to it, right? The park might say, you know, we did everything we were supposed to do. The roller coaster functioned as designed. There was a software problem. This has never happened before. It's gonna be a big suing match. So let's think about the Twitters and blocking Donald Trump and all of his messages and people trying to hold the Twitters reliable or hold the Twitters um, liable for content that users were posting. Is it Twitter's fault that he was posting things on there? Well, when you look at these three bullet points here, that's pretty hard to enforce. Why would the platform be responsible for individual users? If you look at the third bullet point, Twitter is a service. Would T-Mobile be responsible if a message didn't go through, like you message your, your friends that you're gonna go do something later, are you gonna sue Twitter that the message didn't go through? And yes, section 230 does protect them from liability, but then the Twitter CEO Dorsey was trying to take down messages and block it. So um, trying to kind of circumvent 230. So even though 230 existed, he was sort of overpowering that. Uh, people are saying Facebook didn't do a good job of policing those messages. Well, 230, uh, Act 230, Section 230 prevents them from having to, but why were people attacking Facebook for having to do it when they may not be responsible? They're not necessarily responsible for the content, but they do pull down messages that incite violence and, and other types of harm. And um, the ethics of it, the responsibility of it, the privacy of it, this is really hard. You know, there's no cut and dry. This is all gray. Everything is gray and the legislation is never gonna keep up. So again, this is here just a little bit to make us think, make us think who might be the one responsible. Ultimately, I think everybody's responsible for their own actions. Um, even if you take it as a message from somebody else, I think we're probably all responsible for our own actions, no matter what. Um, Nobody has to do anything that somebody is telling them to do. Um, we just get caught up in the blame game. Okay. Let's just see. Okay, I have five more slides here. We'll take a break and then we'll talk about VW and we'll be done. So system quality, data quality, system errors, what is an acceptable technology and feasible level of quality? Well, perfectly flawless operating software is just never gonna happen. 
by the time you developed it, the software would be irrelevant or have cost so much money to get it um, out the door that it probably one would have never made it out the door and two, no one would be able to afford it because it costs so much. So you, you know that you're gonna release software um, knowing full well that it's gonna have bugs in it. You're gonna plan for it and you're releasing your um, list of known issues and how you're gonna fix it. Um, the three principal sources of poor system performance, software bugs, errors, um, hardware or facility failures. And the last one here is garbage in, garbage out. Poor data, poor input data quality. Put garbage in, you're gonna get garbage out. Quality of life, equity, access, and boundaries. Some negative social consequences of systems. You know, we can look potentially at Parler and the insurrection to a point of some negative social consequences of these platforms. Balancing power, the center versus the periphery. Um, the people that might put messages out in platforms and uh, the folks that are receiving it at the the edges, and those that might not actually be acting on it versus those who might take some action on some message. And, and I'm not necessarily relating to um, capital insurrection here. I'm just in any kind of message. Let's talk about anti-vax movement. Um, let's talk about um, movements within neighborhoods, cities, things along those lines, um, access to information. Um, the people that are putting the information out there might be the ones that are at the center of power and those that are receiving it and thinking about it, dwelling or potentially acting on it could be on the periphery of that. The rapidity of change, um, reduced response time to competition. So we are able to, let's take a look at COVID and how quickly um, we can get, as the pandemic was uh, winding up, um, in an ideal situation, the faster we could get changing information about how to deal with the virus and the pandemic, the better we could have been prepared, the better we could have responded to keep people safe. As vaccine information started to become available, a faster response time to get that out um, still certainly could have saved lives. As it begins to roll out more, um, faster response to know who is available to get the vaccine or where they can get it certainly can save lives as well. So I'm taking it out of competition here and saying that this is just faster response times can positively affect the, the competition. Um, if you're talking about launching new products, then of course, um, new products or services that reduce response time um, or faster customer service response time um, can certainly get you a, at a competitive advantage uh, over other, comp uh, other competitors in your market space. Along the lines of this technology and maintaining the boundaries, family, work, and leisure. <laughs> you're connected to all of these, to your, to your work when you're at the, at, at the office um, or wherever your work may be. When you come home and you're hopefully eating dinner with your family, um, are you still responding to or thinking about work? Um, when you're on vacation, is your work cell phone with you? Um, when you're at work, are you posting on social media? Um, a lot of companies have policies where you can't post on social media while you're supposed to be at work. You're not supposed to be browsing the internet for personal uses while you're on work time. Trying to maintain some of those boundaries of the different things you do in the different settings can be extraordinarily difficult. Uh, let me just quickly think of this and grab this on Amazon. I have two minutes. There's nothing in front of me at this exact second. Let me throw a couple things in my Amazon cart. Well, you could be, you could be breaking a boundary that work has asked you to, to maintain. The dependence and the vulnerability. Um, you can take a look at this, uh, some of the, the different I don't want to say cultures, the different populations within within our, our society, um, those who may who may rely on some of the technologies for their day-to-day -day living or to to get food or to get access to services. Um, or uh, people that may be 
um, in situations that um, are there because uh, of the technology. Maybe they're subject to cyberbullying. Maybe they're subject to um, a, a certain situation because maybe the pandemic that we're in and everybody has to work remotely and um, we're dependent on the IS um, to do our work, to, to maintain our lives. So being able to have some of these boundaries where when the work day is over, for instance, you can put it away. Um, or maybe you it's the only thing that's the having FaceTime, uh, having a computer or iPad is helping some of our populations that don't have access to the outside world so easily maintain those connections with their family and friends. And lastly, the, the computer crime and abuse, for sure. Um, so many new, new different types of of crimes and, and abuse of abuse of the, those crimes, but people, and they, again, I, I bring up cyberbullying because it's certainly uh, relevant, prevalent, and not going away in any meaningful, any meaningful way. So the computer crime, the abuse, um, we talked about spam. Um, the one um, legislation that I wanted to bring up was the Can Spam Act of 2003. And this to a point is controlling spam. Um, but it also contains, um, this means the, the controlling of, uh, controlling the assault of non-solicited pornography and marketing. So um, this is all around emails that you shouldn't be receiving, either containing some kind of pornography links um, or marketing. But it's controlling the assault of non-solicited uh, pornography and marketing. And it's really all around spam. And this is considered abuse, using the computer as abuse. Um, when we think of employment, and this is around access and equity, trickle down technologies. Um, certain people in the company, certain lines of business, um, certain levels of management getting newer computers, faster computers, stronger computers, better, latest technology, and then end users might be working on older computers, latent equipment, latency equipment, legacy equipment, um, and it being a long time before they get adequate equipment really to be doing their jobs um, versus a more equitable distribution of, of computers across the company. Everyone gets what they need to do their job versus any kind of priority um, in the technology distribution. And the re-engineering job loss. So as computers or automation comes in to take over any kind of job, what are we doing to retrain um, our, 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 our teams, our, our staff? What are we doing to get them into other jobs? Um, or what are we doing to allow the technology and the human to work together? And also when I talk about equity and access, the digital divide. The digital divide that I refer to is not between us and maybe our grandparents, where we know how to use our iPhone and maybe they don't. The equity and access here, the digital divide, is very much between the haves and the have-nots. Those subsets of society that don't have access to a computer, uh, to Wi-Fi, um, to a broadband connection, to do remote learning, during the pandemic um, or access to these technologies in the non-pandemic times to supplement their learning or to go to school or to be able to do homework. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, they shouldn't not just having a cell phone. It's more than just not having a cell phone because a cell phone is a luxury. But it, in 2021, um, everybody should have the access they need, the technology, the equipment they need to do the appropriate learning for them. And maybe I don't need the school to provide my, me a laptop, but somebody else does. And equality is everybody gets the same laptop. And that's not what equity is. Equity is the people that need a laptop, get a laptop. If you have Wi-Fi at home and broadband at home, you don't get school or community sponsored Wi-Fi or broadband, um, the folks that need it do, so that everybody is brought up to the same level of access. 
That's the digital divide that we're talking about. When we look at poor parts of the country, disadvantaged communities, disadvantaged parts of the country, that's the digital divide. And that's where we need to fill the gap. That's where we need to work. Um, and that's the last point I wanted to make on the equity access and the boundaries. Any questions there? Thoughts? Have I lost you guys yet? Anybody making sleeps? Anybody about to make sleeps? Rudy, Rudy is making sleeps. He's on, he's on the couch in his blanket. Okay, um, it's 829. Um, let's just, let's take 10 minutes, come back at 840. We're gonna talk about Volkswagen and then we'll wrap it up for the night, okay? I'll see you in 10 minutes.